Would you bow your heads? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. And Lord, as we come, we open our hearts, Lord, to hear what you have for us. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. We're mindful of the many that are sick, many that are grieving, many, Lord, that are going through some difficult times. We pray, Father, that you would touch them and you would minister to them. I pray, Lord, that as we open your word today, God, there's something that would be said that would encourage us, that would remind us that we're in good hands. We're in the, good, in the hands of a wonderful, loving, caring God. So, Father, we ask your blessing today. We do so in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Listen, thank you for being here, and those of you that are watching, God bless you. I want to speak to you today on the subject of finding hope in our uncertainties. Let me say that again. Finding hope in our uncertainties. You know, uh, 2020, 2020 has been quite a year. Can I hear a good amen to that? I mean, there's a global pandemic, economic recession, unemployment, political division, cultural upheaval, racial tension, record wildfires, floods, even derechos. I don't know if you've ever heard the word derecho before. There's a picture, but that's a type of a storm. It's a straight line windstorm. I had never heard about it. It causes hurricane force winds, tornadoes, heavy rains, flash floods, all at the same time. And uh, it hit the mid, mid, uh, middle part of our country this year. On top of all of this, there are people that have relapsed, that were doing well, that have gone back to drinking, gone back to to the drugs. Many are struggling with depression, with grief, with fear. Hopelessness has gripped the hearts of a lot of people to the point where they're telling us that the suicide rate is escalating like never before. According to a recent survey, this is what they said. Three in four Americans report that constant stream of bad news has taken a tremendous toll on their lives. 80% are desperate to be cheered up. If ever there's a year we need hope and we need encouragement, it is this year. Can I hear a good amen to that? It's been a difficult year. One of the things that's been interesting is I've heard people say, you know what, I can't wait for 2020 to be over, as if everything will automatically reset on January 1st. No, this will continue. But here's my point. There's a lot of people that are losing hope. You know, hope these days is hard to find here in uh, in America. Not only is it hard to find, it's difficult to to define. You know, some people, when they talk about hope, they equate equate hope with an optimistic feeling that all will turn out well. For some, hope is wishful thinking. Pastor, I just want this to disappear. I want it to be over as fast as it came. I want it to be gone. I think a lot of people were thinking that in March when it all broke loose, and here we are at the end of the year, and they're saying that it's probably not going to be for till the summer or the fall of next year. But maybe you're here or maybe you're watching and maybe you've lost hope because of what has happened in 2020. Maybe this year has been a very difficult year for you. You know, maybe you've gone through a lot. Maybe even lost loved ones. Maybe even uh, have been sick. But I, I notice a lot of people have lost hope. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12. It says, hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. I like the way the message translates this verse. It puts it this way. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heartsick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. And that is so true. You know, when, you're, when you have hope, it makes a difference in your life. By the way, God's word defines hope this way. Biblical hope means to dream and expect with confidence and to cherish a desire with anticipation. You know, for most of us, our lives are filled with uh, sometimes a combination of hope and sometimes hopelessness, sometimes with promise and sometimes with problems. But the definition of Christian hope is much more than simply being optimistic. The definition of Christian hope is more than wishful thinking. You know, in the Old Testament, the the word hope translated in, in in the Hebrew actually means to bind together often by twisting. That's the word hope in the Old Testament. It refers to the process of making a rope by twisting two strands of material together. That's how they made ropes. So hope means, in the Old Testament, hope means to wrap my problems, take my problems and wrap them together with God's promise. And when you do that, you come up with, a, uh, with, a, with a, an equation, an equation that says, you know what, uh, my problems plus God's promises equals God's provision. Over there in Ecclesiastes, in chapter 4, 
Verse 12, it says this. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You know, we usually talk about that verse about friendship and you need people, but I'm, I'm telling you, you need hope also. And when you take all you're going through and all that's happened in 2020 and you, your problems and, and you add God's promises, what you're going to find is God's provision and God's provision is always hope. God wants to give you hope. God wants you in these uncertain times to be filled of hope. So, you know, in, in a nutshell, biblical hope is believing what God has already promised us, what God says he will do. And if you're a believer, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has made some amazing promises that you can stand on that will give you hope. You know, I think of people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and they have nothing to stand on. They have nothing to look forward to. You know what? All of their thinking, all of their hope is wishful thinking. But for the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? Our hope is not wishful thinking. It's based on what God has said, on the promises of God. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said, during the most difficult times, I will be with you. God says, I will be your provider. I will be your healer. I will be everything that you need. I want you to know that and remember that during these difficult, uncertain times. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, notice what it says. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. You know that word, those who trust in the Lord, is, that, is actually the word hope. Some of your Bible says those that wait on the Lord. It's the Hebrew word kaba. And it actually means to look forward to, to expect, to bind together. And those people that look forward, that wait on the Lord, that have hope, that are binding, you know what, tying together what they're going through, their problems with the promises of God, those are the ones that will get hope. And those who have hope, it says they will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. I'm praying and I'm declaring for you that you will be an eagle and you will rise up in the midst of all that's going down. And instead of you, you know what, being downtrodden and being discouraged that you will rise up and say, you know what, I serve a big God, a God that says that if I wait on him, if I trust in him, if I hope in him, he will lift me up. He wants to lift you up today. You know, in the New Testament, the word hope is used over 70 times just in the New Testament. And it's always grounded on God and God's word and the promises of God. So with that in mind, I, I want to tell you a story. I want to read you a story from the Bible about people that lived in uncertain times, but they were hoping in the Lord. It's found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2, starting with verse 22. Let me give you the setting, and then I want to read it to you. The setting of this passage takes place after the birth of Jesus. Joseph and Mary, you know what, bring Jesus to the temple to present him to be dedicated. By the way, we base our ch dedication of children on the example of Jesus. But they were also there, the Bible says, because Mary needed to be purified, uh, purified according to the Levitical law, the practices of the Jews, because she had given birth. And we're introduced here to two characters who make their appearance there in the final acts of the Christmas story. One of the men is Simeon, and the woman's name is Anna. They're not husband and wife. They just happen to be there. They're elderly folks there at the temple. You're not going to find these people in the nativity uh, scenes. You're not going to find them in Christmas cards. But both of them are significant people in that first Christmas. Important people. Both of them exhibited hope in the midst of uncertainty. Both of them believed for the best, even though things were terrible. They were waiting for, you know what, they weren't waiting for something. They were waiting for someone. And that someone that they were waiting for was the Messiah. Notice what it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Let me pick up the story from the Bible. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Notice we're introduced to Simeon. And notice that he's eagerly waiting. In other words, he's alert. And you say, well, what is he alert to? He's alert to the coming of the Messiah, the appearance of the Savior. And he's ready to welcome him. Now, Simeon, we know, was a little older, a guy, and he's been waiting. He knows that his days are short, but he's looking forward to seeing the Messiah. But notice what it says about Simeon. Notice what the Bible tells us about him. It tells us three things about him. He was a righteous man. You know, the word righteous is dikaos in the Greek, and it actually means his life lined up with the word of God. 
He didn't just talk about God. He lived out the word of God. He didn't just talk about a savior and a, a God that loved him. He lived it out. That's what righteousness means. And then it says he was devout or he was reverent. In other words, he took his faith serious. You know, he just just talked about his faith. He lived it out. And then thirdly, he was receptive. He was waiting. You say, well, what was he waiting for? Well, I told you. He, was, he longed for God to send the Savior of the world into his chaos, into his uncertainty. He expected God to fulfill his promise of a Messiah during his lifetime. You know, in those days, hope was hard to find because they were difficult times. They were trying times for Israel. Israel was a defeated nation living under the Roman Empire, under the dictatorship of, 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 of Caesar, under the rule and the oppression of, of the Romans. And for 400 years, they had not heard the word of God. From the last prophet Malachi, 400 years had gone by since uh, an angel appeared to the shepherds and to Mary and to, and to Joseph. And he says, I bring great news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto this day, the Savior will be born. God's King has come. The Messiah is here. And the Holy Spirit had made that clear to Simeon that he would not die without seeing the Messiah. Notice it says that in verse 26 of Luke 2. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And that day, the Spirit led him, led Simeon to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required. So notice that the Holy Spirit was with him. The Holy Spirit was speaking to Simeon. And, and that day, the Holy Spirit told Simeon, you need to be at the church. You need to be at the temple courts. You need to be there on the right day, at the right time, because Joseph and Mary are going to bring baby Jesus to the temple, and you are going to be able to see him before you die. The Bible says that Simeon obeyed, and he got there. And when Simeon saw the baby Jesus, who's about six weeks old by this time, notice what he does in verse 28. Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he began to praise God. So I want you to imagine that. Here comes Joseph and Mary to the temple to, to dedicate Jesus for her to fulfill her purification rites. Simeon is there. He sees Jesus. He rushes up to Mary and Joseph, reaches down, takes Jesus in his arms, and he begins to praise God. He begins to sing. Can you imagine what he must have felt after a lifetime of waiting for the Messiah and here is the Messiah, and he holds him in his arms. Can you imagine the feeling? But can you imagine the feeling of Joseph and Mary? Can you imagine, you know what, someone comes up to you and just snatches your baby out of your arms and starts singing out loud and starts praising God. I'm sure it was a bit unsettling for them. But they begin to hear what he was saying as he breaks out in praise. And by the way, what we have recorded here is what is called the, the Song of Simeon. And in verse 29 to 32, this is what it says. This is what he sang. This is what he said. Sovereign God, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Now, now notice, notice Simeon has seen the Savior, and he says, Lord, I'm ready to die. I can now rest in peace. I can now die in peace. I can now go to my eternal home in peace. By the way, you're not ready to die until you've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. Until you come to him, you're not ready to die. And that's what he says. He says, I'm ready to depart. It's a, it's a word that means releasing a prisoner, taking down a tent, unyoking a beast of burden. It means to set free. It means to release. And, and what Simeon is saying is what we believe as Christians. When a believer dies, they're released from the burdens of this life. You know what? They rest from their labors. They're ushered into the blessing of eternal life. That's why for the Christian, when we take our last breath, it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a new life, new eternity, a new world with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why sometimes you go to a Christian funeral and you're taken back. Why is there not that much despair? Why is there so much hope? Because our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't grieve. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope, the Bible says. We have a, a, an eternal hope. And, and notice, as Simeon worships the Lord and praises God, notice the response of Joseph and Mary. You're thinking, what are they doing? Verse 33, Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Some of your Bible says they marveled. You know what? They were astonished. They admired 
Because, you know, what, what he's saying, and he's going to continue, Simeon's going to continue, and he's going to prophesy. Notice verse 34, then Simeon blessed him, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. You know, Simeon not only is worshiping God, but he prophesies. He tells them what they can expect. And one of the things they can expect, Mary and Joseph, is that the coming of Jesus would divide the world. It would split people into two groups. His coming has caused some to fall and others to rise. That's what Simeon said. You say, well, who are those? Well, well those who fall are those who, uh, who are those that fall? Who are those that rise up? Well, Jesus, during his ministry, he came and he spoke like no man had spoken. And everything he said is, you have to make a decision about who I am. You see, you cannot say he was a good man. You cannot say he was a good teacher. Because Jesus said he was the son of God, the savior of the world. And you have to make a decision about that. So Jesus is either a rock you build your life upon, and that's the sense of rising, or he's a rock you stumble over, and that's what it means to fall. You see, when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask him to come into your life, you rise. You're lifted up. You know what? You're, you're, you become a child of God. If you deny the Lord Jesus Christ, you will stumble and you will fall. Now, some people say, well, I haven't made up my mind. I'm neutral about that. Listen, you can't be neutral. You're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. Either you're moving closer to him or you're moving further away from him. You either have the son of God or you don't have the son of God. It's a choice that you must make. And that is what Simeon says. Mary and Joseph, many people will fall. Many people will stumble. Many people will be scandalized by the words of Jesus. But others will embrace him and be saved. And their lives will be turned around. And they will rise up. And they will soar. And they will be people of hope. And they will have a transformation of life. That's why those of you that have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've risen up. You've overcome the adversity and the uncertainty and all that has come into your life. Because of Jesus Christ. Now Simeon has one last word for Mary. In verse 35, notice what he says. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your very soul. By the way, sometimes in the Bible, the word sword means a dagger. But here, it actually means a big, large, wide blade sword. Like the one Goliath would have used. And the idea that Simeon shares with Mary that day is that, listen, your soul will be sliced open. And you will experience extreme anguish as a result of this, your son, who is born. You know, John, later on in the gospel, in John chapter 19, he tells us exactly that. He tells us that Mary stood by the cross as Jesus was crucified. She had witnessed his beating, his scourging. She had witnessed him being nailed, you know, in his hands and in his feet. The crown put on his head, the, 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 the spear thrusted through his side, executed like a, like a common criminal. And, and the Bible says that she, as she stood there, her own soul was being pierced and torn. You know, and as she watches what her son went through, like a criminal, all to save the world, all to take upon himself the sins of mankind, your sins and my sins. You know, and here's Simeon. Simeon is excited. He's praising God. You know what? Because he was hoping. He was hoping for rest. He was hoping, I, I want to, before I die, I want to go in peace. I want to know that the Messiah has come. By the way, you can have hope and you can rest. By the way, one of the benefits of hope and, and, and taking what you're going through and combining it with what God says is not only God's provision, but it will give you rest. It will give you peace. And Simeon says, I am ready. Release me, God. Take me home. I'm done. And then the Bible introduces us to another person that day. Her name is Anna. And she's there also. And she's also hoping. But she's not hoping for rest and she's not hoping for peace. She's hoping for redemption. She's hoping for salvation. We're introduced to her in verse 36. Notice what it says. Anna, a prophet. By the way, if you have a hard time with women being prophets, then you have to explain that to me. Because the Holy Spirit said Anna was a prophet and was also there in the temple. And she was the daughter of Penuel from the tribe of Asher. And she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple. But she stayed there day and night worshiping God with fasting and with prayer. 
Notice, here's Anna. You know what, she's 84 at this time. We don't know how long she's been a widow. But, but the Bible says, after her husband died, she dedicated herself to fasting and prayer in the temple. In other words, she never left the temple. She worshiped there day and night. I like the way it says it in the Greek. In the Greek it says, she kept on not leaving. In other words, she, stepped, she stayed there. It was important for her to be in the house of the Lord. And she was there looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, just as, just as Simeon was, just a little different perspective. Instead of looking for rest, she was looking for redemption. Look at verse 38. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. So notice, Simeon is singing, praising, going on there with the baby Jesus in front of Mary and Joseph. She hears a commotion. She rushes over there. And as she sees that, she burst out into praise. And she began to praise the Lord also. You know where it says, you know what, she, speaking of him, it means you couldn't shut her up. You couldn't quiet her up. They were loud. They were excited. Every once in a while, you go to church and you hear people get loud and excited. And you say, what's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. They're full of hope. They're excited about what God has promised and what God's going to do. Amen. Some of you, that might bother you. It used to bother me, and I'm a pastor. But you know what? I'm realizing that some people, they praise God because God has done so much things. I had a friend when I was recently saved. He was a, an older man. His name was Peter. And Peter had been an alcoholic all his life. One of those alcoholics that when he couldn't get his, his uh, distilled alcohol, he would drink literally anything that had alcohol. And he would find him often in the alleys, thrown, passed out. And one day, he tells a story that a little girl, they were, a church was out ministering, and they go through this alley, a little 10, 11-year-old girl gave him a flyer, a little tract, and he read it, and he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Transformed his life. And I can remember as a young man being at the church where he attended, and I would preach, and he was so loud. He was so loud, he was distracting. And sometimes I would say, somebody's got to shut Peter up. He's, he's distracting me. And one day I said, Peter, you got to be quiet, bro. You're, you make too much noise. And he says to me, well, you don't know what God has done in my life. You don't know how God has changed my life. He goes, Vic, I, I'm not trying to make anybody angry. I'm not trying to make anybody mad. I just want you to know that God has done so many things in my life. I can't be quiet. I got to shout out the praises of God. You know, later on, you know, the Bible tells us that on the day Jesus entered Jerusalem, you know what, before the crucifixion, the last week of his life, that the people started praising him, Hosanna, you know what, worship the king of the Jews. And, and the Pharisees told him, shut the people up, you know. They're, they're making ridicule, spectacle of themselves. And the Bible says, Jesus said, if they be quiet, these rocks will praise me. Listen, if you and I don't praise him, the rocks are going to praise him. Amen. If you and I don't raise our voices, you know what, the rocks will raise their voices. So here's, here's Mary, here's, here's Anna, and she comes. And she can't be quiet. You know why? She's waiting expectantly for God to, to send the Messiah to rescue and redeem Jerusalem. By the word, that word, that word to rescue, that word to deliver, that word is a word ransom. Ransom is something that has to be paid to release people who are held captives. And Jesus came, you know what, to release us of captivity. He came to redeem us. You say, what did he came to, to release us from? From sin and from death and from hell. By the way, redemption implies certain things. Redemption implies bondage. Bondage means that you are enslaved to something. And the Bible says all of us, before we come to Christ, are enslaved to sin. We need to be redeemed. We need to be ransomed. And Jesus Christ on the cross, he bought you. He ransomed you from sin and the effect of sin. <clears throat> redemption also implies a cost. A price has to be paid to buy the slave, to redeem, to set those people free. And Jesus Christ on the cross, he paid that price. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He loved us while we were yet sinners. And then the third thing that redemption implies is ownership of that which is redeemed. You see, when someone would redeem something, it was now theirs. It was no longer the enemies. It was not, they were no longer their own. They belonged to somebody now. And you know, when you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you were redeemed from sin. You were purchased, a price were paid. And now you belong to God. You're not your own. You belong to the Lord. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you are not your own. You were bought with the price. So glorify God in your body. You are the Lord. Live for the Lord. Honor the Lord. I'm not myself. A lot of people think God saves me to clean me up so I can have a, you know, a better life. No, he saved you so that you could honor him and serve him and your life would be his now. So Anna was there. And she's waiting with hope for the Savior so that people could be set free from their sins forever. And here he is at last. He has arrived. You know what? He's purchased us. He's paid the price. That's why he came. The angel told the, the, the people that, that first Christmas, it's in Matthew 121, it says, She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. That's what he came to do, to save you. By the way, God loves you and he wants to save you. You know what? He wants to redeem you from your sin. He wants to change your life. He wants you to bring you into the family of God. He wants you to love him and to serve him. And, and, and that's what they're doing. Anna and Simeon are there at the temple holding on to hope. I want you to hold on to hope. During these uncertain times, don't lose hope. During these uncertain times, don't give up. And you say, well, pastor, how? How can I not lose hope. I mean, do you see what's happened? Don't you see what's going on? I, 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 I'm losing hope. Well, what do we do? Well, let me tell you what to do. You know what? If you're going to hold on to hope, do what Anna and do what Simeon did. I don't know if you paid attention, but they did three things during their uncertain times. First thing they did is that they worshiped. Did you, do you remember? It says he took him in his arms and he blessed God. It tells us that Anna was worshiping and fasting and praying day and night. Why don't you choose to worship? Put God first. Listen, worship is not something we do on Sunday mornings. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a life that says, you know what? I love God and I serve God. And he is my God and he is my savior. And he is my hope. Worship God. That's what they did. Because what happens sometimes when we lose hope, we want to give up on God. You know what? We want to quit. We want to throw in the towel. We want to say he's not real. No, the fact that you and I go through uncertain times doesn't mean it's real. It simply means we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that has difficulties. We live in a world where we mess up sometimes too. But worship God. That's what they did. The second thing that they did is that they witnessed. In other words, did you notice that they're boldly declaring stuff about Jesus, the Messiah? Did you notice that, that Simeon said he's a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of the people of Israel? Did you notice that Anna said, you know what, he is, he is the child that we're expecting that will come and rescue uh, Jerusalem. In other words, they're sharing the good news. They couldn't keep the good news to themselves. Why don't you, instead of losing hope, why don't, and why don't you worship and why don't you share the hope that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let your light shine. You know what, in a time of a lot of darkness, you know, turn up your light Throw it all the way up. Let people see the light and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Hallelujah. You know, I believe with all my heart, one of the best ways people can see your light is through your marriage. You know what I'm noticing right now? A lot of marriages are struggling. And as they see your godly marriages that are thriving, that are strong, that are holding on, they're looking at you and they're saying, how in the world do you do that? How do you have a strong marriage? Even during the good times, how do you do it? But during the difficult times, how do you stay strong? Because marriage is so hard. Marriage is so difficult. And they're going to look at you and you're going to say, it's Jesus. He is our hope. He is our rock. You know what? We have made a commitment to put him first in our lives. And we have taken all that we go through, all our problems, and we twist him and we, you know what? We sort of put him... Uh, knit them together with God and God's promises. And that has resulted in blessing and provision and hope. You know what? And hanging in there. That's how we do it. So witness the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the third thing they did is that they waited. They were there waiting. There was a, the Bible says that he was there waiting. The Bible says she was there waiting. You know, biblical hope is always linked to waiting. Waiting on the Lord. And that's hard to do. You know, during these uncertain times, it's so hard to wait. Those of us that are Christians, we're like, God, where are you? Why did you let this happen? You could have put a stop to this yesterday. You could do it right now. You have the power. We believe you do. What are you, why are you not doing anything? Well, the reason why God is doing something. 
And one of our roles is to wait on the Lord. Isaiah 8, 17 says, I will wait for the Lord and I will hope in him. We're waiting on God. You know what? God does things in his time, not in our time. But sometimes we want to get ahead of God. We want to tell God what we, to do. Don't get ahead of God. Don't get far behind God. Get in step with God. God is doing something. I believe during these times of uncertainty, God is speaking to us in some powerful ways. Don't take things for granted. Don't take loved ones for granted. You know what? Appreciate people. People that you thought were nobodies. They're the important people that have kept us going. You know what? The essential workers. We're learning a lot. And God is saying, don't waste these uncertain times. I'm using them to speak to your heart. So what did they do? Well, I'll tell you what they did. They worshiped, they witnessed, and they waited. How are you going to hang on to hope? Do the same thing. Worship God. Put him first. Honor him. Tell about the Lord Jesus Christ. Share your hope in the Lord Jesus and hang in there. Wait on the Lord. God's timing is a lot better than ours. Can I hear a good amen to that? And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, you cannot do that. You cannot do that on your own strength. You cannot do that on your own power. But Jesus provides everything that you need. He provides the very things Simeon and Anna were hoping and waiting for. He provided the rest and the redemption. What are you hoping for in this season of your life? What are you waiting for? What are you expecting? Or maybe you're expecting nothing. I'm talking to people all the time. They say, you know, Pastor, I don't expect anything anymore. In my mind, everything's canceled. We canceled Christmas. We canceled birthday. We canceled everything. You know what? My life is canceled. You know what? Things will never be the same. There's nothing to look forward to anymore. People are dying all around us. People are sick all around us. People are hurting all around. You know what? I'm not hoping for anything. Well, I'll tell you, God wants you to have hope. God wants you to hang in there. There's a lot to hope for. There are brighter days ahead. There are wonderful days ahead. Listen, there's rest and peace for some of you that are hurting. Some of you are hurting so much, you need peace, you need rest. Some of you are lonely, you're empty, you're afraid, you're just worn out. You need some comfort. You need a, a fresh sense of the presence of God. And God says, if you let me, I'll fill your life with my presence. You know what Jesus said, if you're looking anywhere else, you're not going to find it. You're going to find it in me. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Jesus said these words, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you need rest, throw your burdens upon the Lord. Transfer them. Take them off your shoulder and say, Lord, here they are. They're yours. And you're going to be amazed and surprised what God does when you do that. You have to do it, though. Some of you here, and you need redemption. Like Anna, you're looking for her because you're plagued with guilt and shame because of something you've done or the way you've been living. One of the things that this pandemic has revealed in many lives is how wretched some of the lives were, how selfish some people, how unloving and uncaring some people were. And right now, there's a lot of people that are full of guilt and shame, and they feel God's punishing me. You know what? All of this has happened to me because God is punishing me. And, and some of you are thinking there's no way out. There's no hope. I'm trapped in this pattern. I've developed this lifestyle that I cannot break out of. And I feel hopeless. And I feel that things are never going to get better. Well, I want to tell you there is hope. And that hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to ransom you. He came to deliver you. He came to save you. He came to turn your life around. He came to transform you. But you have to open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anna and Simeon were open and waiting on the Lord. I want to ask you, are you open and are you waiting? I want to end by just sharing some things that I would ask you to do. Some action steps. And here's number one. Listen, there's a lot of people out there hurting. Give hope to those who are hurting during this time. Encourage people. Suicide is an all-time high. Don't just walk by people and ignore them. Walk slow. Pay attention. Open your eyes to the need. Look people in the eyes and say, you're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Pray for discernment from God. And say, Lord, I don't just want to walk by and be so overwhelmed with my life and what I'm going through. That, Lord, I'm not, I'm not open and aware of what's going on around me. People around you, your, your spouse, your children, your friends, they need encouragement. During this time, 
of unprecedented, during this unprecedented time in history, why don't you make a commitment to give hope and encourage people? But here's what I know. You can't give hope if you don't have it. You cannot give encouragement if you don't have encouragement. That's why you need Jesus. That's why you need to open your heart. And you know what? And receive the hope, the hope of the world, the hope of humanity. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing I'm going to encourage you to do. Read the scriptures to find hope. The Bible says in Romans 15, 4, through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You want to hear from God? People say, well, God's not speaking to me. One of the ways God speaks to you is through his word. Crack open his word. Open his word. Tell the Lord, Lord, lead me to scripture and speak to my heart. And it's going to blow your mind how God will do that. And here's number three. Force yourself to remember God's faithfulness. You see, during uncertain times, we tend to think it's always been this way. It's always been bad. No, there's been good times. There's been great times. God's faithfulness is seen. The prophet Jeremiah lived, lived, lived during a, a time of uncertainty. Worse than what we're living through today. And it was overwhelming for him. But he wrote these words in Lamentation 3, 18 to 23. As he reminds himself of the faithfulness of God. Notice, I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget these awful times as I grieve over my loss. Yet I shall dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I want you to notice what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is intentional. Forcing him to, to focus on, on what is true. And what is true is, yes, things are tough. Yes, things are difficult. But I serve a faithful God, a good God, that has seen me through worse than this. Yes. Hold on to hope when it's hard to cope. That's what Jeremiah is doing. That's what I'm asking you to do. Hold on to hope when it's hard to cope. And here's the fourth thing I'm going to ask you to do. Repent. Receive Christ. First of Chronicles 29, 15 says, our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. And that is true if you don't know Christ. You know, these days are terrible, difficult, unbearable days for people that have no hope. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 tells us that hope has a name. Paul writes and it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Until you're saved, you're never going to find hope. You might have wishful thinking. You might have moments of optimism. But deep hope where what you're going through, your problems are, are knitted together with God's promises and what God, what God says he will do. And you know, what result in God's provision, you will never experience that until hope has come to your life through the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Lamentation 3.25, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the ones who seek him. You see, the key isn't to hope for something. The key is to hope for someone. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.3, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, when I think about all that's happening today, and I look around, I see pain. I see disappointment. I see a lot of hurting. I see a lot of uncertainty in the lives of a lot of people. But it reminds me, that that's why Jesus came. He came to change us and to help us during our messes and our mistakes, during our stresses, during our sin, during our pain, during our problems. He came to give us hope in the midst of hopelessness. You know, for, for many people, it wasn't a, a Merry Christmas. All it was was a big mess. No Merry Christmas, just a mess. Well, listen, Christ specializes in messes. Your mess is not too big for God. And until you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're never going to find rest. And you'll never be ready for your eternal rest when it's time for you to die. I want to invite you to, to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to save you and to give you the hope. Hope is a person. It's Jesus. Would you bow your heads? And it's simple as a prayer like this. It's simple as telling God, Lord, not only do I need hope, but I've allowed my sin to control me. I repent of all I've been living. And I want you to be my savior. Save me from my sins. I need your help. I need your hope. 
Thank you for coming to our world and paying the price for my redemption. Thank you for dying in my place on the cross. Thank you for being raised on the third day and giving me the hope of heaven. Thank you that because of that, you're alive and well today. And Lord, we serve a living God. So today I open my heart and I receive you into my life. Lord, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. And Father, from this day forward, if there's anything in my life that doesn't please you, Lord, and I'm sure there's a lot, help me to get rid of it so I can give hope to others. So Father, thank you for the great hope that is ours in Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I hear a good amen to that?